I got a Bible here somewhere. We all to pieces this morning, ain't we? Thank you, darling. What you doing? If you will take your copy of God's Word and turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Once you find Romans 8, 28, if you'll stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's holy, infallible, and erring, and inspired word that we hold in our hands. Romans 8, 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to You this morning and we pray for help, Lord. Uh, God, we just pray, O oh God, that You'd help us to look past the worldly uh, Lord, activities that we've been in. God, we pray that you'd help us to look past even the, uh, God, the raw service that we've had so far this morning, Lord. God, help us now to look to you, Lord, Holy Spirit of God. We realize, Lord, that you're an awesome God. We realize that we don't need the pragmatisms of the world. So, Father, we just lean on you this morning, Lord, not emotions, Lord, not experience, Lord. But, God, we come to you, Lord, wholeheartedly now, praying, oh, God, Holy Ghost of God, do something through your word this morning. God, help this old, old silly preacher, Lord, this morning as I try to, Lord, give something forth this morning that be a help to someone. God, if there's one lost and undone, Father, in the name of Jesus, touch their hearts this morning, open their eyes. For it's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we look this morning, we uh, look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, and this is a, cur- a verse of hope that that has helped many people for a long time. Uh, I want you to understand this morning that it's Romans 8, 28 that has helped people who were at deathbeds. It has helped people who were trying to move past the loss of a loved one. It's helped people that have been in all kinds of situations because it is a verse of encouragement that tells us that God is always with us even in the midst of our deepest despair. If I were entitled this morning, I'd call it something like this, Suffering may endure for a season. Suffering may endure for a season. As we think about that, I think we all face hardships in life, uh, some at higher degrees, some at lesser degrees. But we've all got our challenges in life that we're going to fight. Whether it be in health, whether it be in finance, whether it be in life, whether it be in trouble, whether it be in a job place, whether it be in in our home place, we all are going to face some type of hardships to some degree in this life. It's upon all mankind, even not Christians are going non Christians are going to have trouble in the world. But friend, this morning what I'm talking about is not necessarily just trouble in the world, but what I'm talking about is to the Christian today who has been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, there is going to be providential hindrances, there's going to be providential trouble in your life. When I say providential, I'm not talking about just happenstance. I'm not talking about problems that you have inflicted upon yourself through the flesh. But I'm talking about uh, problems that come as a result of God working in our lives. You see, we must distinct in our life those things that are self-inflicted and those things that are providentially inflicted in our lives. Some of us have made a tragedy of our lives. Some of us, all of us, uh, we do sinful things that we shouldn't that are going to hinder our life. We're going to say things and do things and act out things that we shouldn't have done and bring to ourselves some troubles in life. But friend, this morning I want you to understand that there for the Christian, there are problems in our lives that come as a result of God moving directly in our lives. This morning, uh, I want you to be satisfied. We're talking about providential things that God put, but I want you to understand also those self-inflicted things. God can take them and make something good out of them when we read Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And we know that all things... All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. I want you to understand, the context of this verse is written to those who have been born again. Those who have not been born again, you do not have to promise that all things are going to work together for good for those. 
Uh, but friend, I want you to understand this morning that the main idea that I'd like you to grab is that God will make everything in our lives work for good. God will make everything in our lives work for good. As I think about Romans 8.28 and I think about the subject of suffering may endure for a season, I think about the story of Joseph. You remember Joseph in the Bible over in Genesis that Joseph was a young boy and he was Jacob's son and Jacob loved his baby boy Joseph. Joseph had uh, other brothers, uh, roughly 12 other brothers, 11 11 other brothers uh, that were older than him. And Joseph was blessed of God and he saw a vision of God. God said, I'm going to take you to the high places and your brothers are going to bow down to you. Well, little Joseph, just a little uh, young fella, he comes and tells his brothers and his brothers hated him for that. We ain't going to bow to you. Who do you think you are? Anyway, they take Joseph and sell him into slavery. And you remember the story also well that even in slavery, Joseph was sold to Potiphar, his slave master, and Potiphar put him over everything in charge of everything in the house. Boy, I tell you what, you can't hold down God's people even in, a slave, in, a, even in slavery, they shine forth. Well, we understand that Potiphar's wife made a false accusation, and this Joseph, who was going to be used by God, and who's being providentially placed by God in slavery, that don't sound fair, does it? How many of y'all been put in slavery? Well, the workplace is pretty close, but we don't know what slavery is when we've been sold into slavery. Amen? We look and we see that not only that, now he's put into prison. Providentially, God puts Joseph into prison. Are you serious? Put me in prison providentially? That ain't fair. God did it. And he had a purpose in it. All things work together for good to those that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Joseph goes to the prison and he stays there. And finally, Joseph comes out of that prison. God puts him second in charge in the land for the preservation of the nation Israel. Boy, Joseph here is understanding that suffering may endure for a season. Providentially being placed by God in a prison and in slavery. Not only that, but I think about the story of Esther in the Bible. The Old Testament book of Esther, you could read it. Just ten chapters there. And Esther, a Jew, was put in a place that she shouldn't have been. You remember that she had an uncle named Mordecai. And this is during a time when the Jews are in the Babylonian captivity. Uh, Israel was, uh, was brought out into Babylonian captivity and they were taken into a land and dispersed and basically put in slavery in the land. But here Mordecai is and here Esther is. And God gave Esther, made her a beautiful woman. I'm talking about a beautiful woman. Uh, because uh, here all of a sudden Mordecai brings Esther in to the king's throne. Now here's something that happens. That the king, what, which was over Babylon, Babylon was overtaken by Persia. Now the Persia king comes up and his wife shows out one day. She doesn't come up and dance in front of all of his party like she's supposed to. She says, I ain't going. He says, all right, providentially. Remember providentially, God, God takes his Persian king and he puts his wife off the throne. Boy, that makes a vacancy, a job opening. Now all of a sudden here, uh, Esther is a Jew who shouldn't even be there, is such, has such beauty that God uses Mordecai to put her before the king, and the king finally takes her in, and uh, takes her into his household, makes her queen. Well, there's an evil man named Haman in the leadership there, and he hates the Jews, and he hates Mordecai. And there uh, in that, that land, he is going to have all of the Jews wiped out, and he's going to have her uncle Mordecai killed. Well, lo and behold, God just providentially puts her right where she needs to be as queen of the land. And boy, there's some suffering. She's out of place and she's having to yield to a king probably who she would not want to yield to. Ultimately, she'd probably like to find the love of her life, some little cute Jewish boy and just have a regular Jewish family. But here God has put her in a distant land and God has put her in a distant palace and God has given, uh, put her under the submission of this king and all of a sudden God uses her to have Haman hanged instead of the Jews and instead of Mordecai. And God used her just like she used Joseph to be a blessing to her people. Friend, I want you to understand that in God's providential places, God is using us to help His people. 
as I think about that, I, I think about how God put these two through trials to help His whole nation. How many trials have you and I been put through to help His church, to help our families, to help others in the community to come through some trial? But God is always taking our suffering for those that are born again, and He's using it for a greater good. I want you to catch just three quick points this morning as we look at Romans chapter 8, verse 28. There are some things that we should know. As God providentially works in our lives, we should know first that the timing could be long. The timing could be long. Second, we should know that the tragedy could be harsh. And third, we need to know that the triumph will be sure. First of all, we look and we see knowing the time could be long. As we look at Romans 8.28, we see there, what does it say? It says, work together. Work together. We see a process here, not a quick instant in time. We see a process that the things that God puts us in and puts before us in life, that even though that might be a process maybe of months, maybe of weeks, maybe of years, possibly even for a lifetime, that there is a process there that that ultimate part in our time of suffering, God is going to work it together. There is no certain time frame when we look at that verse and we see that He's working together. Boy, I'm telling you what, God is actually working our whole lives together isn't he, to come up with something good out of it. But here we look and we think about Joseph again. And I think about Joseph and how God providentially put him into slavery, providentially put him into prison for the purpose purpose of saving his nation. Not only did he do that, he also blessed his servant for the suffering that he went through. Joseph, we see that Joseph suffered half of his life. He was a young boy when he got the vision. He was roughly in his 30s when he finally became second in charge of Egypt and came through the providential time of trial and began to see the providential time of blessing for his suffering. Not only that, but Esther, when we look at Esther, Esther gave all of her life and lived for the rest of her life in a strange land with a strange king. Friend, I want you to understand that she gave up all of her life uh, and all of the things that she would have liked to do, what? For God's providential plan in her life and purpose to save His nation. But God sure blessed her. It probably ain't too hard to sit in a queen's seat, is it? Steak and caviar every night or whatever you want. Hey, God's blessing is sure to those who suffer for His purposes. We look and I think about a, a Esther chapter 4 and verse 14. Let me read that verse to you. I think it will encourage you. This is what the message was to Esther. Uh, Esther chapter 4 verse 14. It says this. It says, For who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as... This, in her moment of despair, in her moment of darkness here, she's reminded, Esther, who knows that you might not be put in this place for such a time as this. This is the thing and to understand, is that Joseph and Esther did not understand God's full purpose for their suffering. This verse came to her as an encouragement because she was in despair in the midst of her providential trial, not understanding what God was doing, but with hope that God was going to bring her out. Joseph, when he was in prison, Joseph, when he was in slavery, did not understand all that was going to happen. He didn't have the hindsight 2020 that you and I have today. How many of us would say, God, would you use us like Joseph when we know the whole story? We would. Many of you ladies might say, God, use me like Esther when you know the whole story because you know you're going to the palace, right? But how many of us would pray with not out knowing the end, God put me in prison. God put me in slavery. God put me in a strange land in a strange house. I don't think we'd be as quick and apt uh, to ask God for providential suffering. We want the providential blessing. We look here and we see we got to know the timing could be long in our suffering. We're not assured that it'll be a short time, a short season. If y'all are like me, boy, right time it starts to hurt, what I want to do? I want to claim victory. God, get me out of this thing. Get me out of this thing now. Get me on out. And when not, God doesn't get us out just in time, do you think we become bitter sometimes with God? I do. Because I don't like it. And I know He's able I know He can do all things, but will He do all things? I know He can pull people out of pits, but will He pull me out of my pit? 
Friend, I want you to understand that we know that, that need to know that when being providentially tried in life, we need to know that the timing could be long. I think about Psalms 119 verse 81, if you'll let me read that to you. Psalms 119 verse 81. I want you to hear the psalmist as he has been through a long period of trial as he's begging for God's help. Psalms 119.81 My soul fainteth for thy salvation. Call out to God. My soul fainteth, it's weary for your salvation. But I hope in thy word, the hope he's still looking for God to bring him out of his test, bring him out of his trial. Verse 82 Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? Oh God, I've got my faith in your word, but when will you comfort me? When will you bring me out of my pit? Uh, verse 83, For I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yet do I not forget thy statutes. I'm still looking in hope, Lord. How many are the days of thy servant? How many days will I suffer? Uh, how many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? Do you see now? Not only is the psalmist in a bad trial, but he's got people that are coming against him. And he's saying, oh God, I know it's coming. I know you're here with me. I know victory's on the way. But when will you remove those that persecute me? The proud have digged pits for me, which are not after thy law. Now he's even got people that are against him, trying to see his fall, demising to his fall. And uh, verse 86, all thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help thou me, O God. They had almost consumed me upon earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. Quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimonies of thy mouth. We see here a servant that is going through hell and high water, but we also see a servant that has set in his mindset, that psalmist said, I'm trusting in your word. I've come too far to turn back now. He said, I'm staying with the word. It's a sure word. It's a faithful word. Can I just tell you that in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your persecutions, in the midst of your suffering, you just keep being faithful to God's word, and I promise you, joy is going to come in the morning. Suffering may endure for a season. Know this, the timing could be long. Not only could the timing be long, but secondly, I think we find that the tragedy could be harsh. The tragedy could be harsh. As we look at verse 28 of Romans 8, what does it say there? It says, all things, all things... We're looking here and we're saying all things. Not just good things, but the Scripture is more so, I think, the context would push even more to the hard things, to the evil things, to the wicked things, to the bad things in our lives that come against us that God is going to make them into good. But He's saying all things. We need to understand that the tragedy and trials that come could be harsh in our life. I think about Job as he had providential trial in his life. That old Job, boy, I tell you what, he was faithful. He was faithful before the trials came. He was faithful during the trial. And bless God, he was faithful in the victory after the trial. But Job, he had a harsh trial, didn't he? Boy, he lost all of his children. They died. I don't understand that. I can't tell you all about that. But I can tell you that God is providentially right in everything that he does. I want you to understand that Job went through sickness. He went through every, every trial, friends, that I think that any human could go to in every area was he tried in his life he lost everything that he had he had been shamed by his friends and God providentially put him in the pit the tragedy could be harsh is what I'm telling you I'm not wishing that on anybody and I'm not sure not wishing it on myself but I'm just shooting a, a, a barrel full of shotgun holes in the prosperity gospel that all they preach is give me a dollar and you'll get ten sometimes God might just crush his servant for his greater glory Joseph, I think about Joseph, and here Joseph is, a young boy, and he's got the providential working of God in his life. God's moving in a mighty way. God has done said at a young age, He said, I'm going to take you and I'm going to destroy you before I build you back up. And Joseph would save his nation and he would be raised to second in Egypt. And friend, that was just a miraculous experience because that should have never happened. Esther, here she is in a foreign land and all of her people in here she suffers and her time of suffering is pretty harsh but God used it all for greater glory. I think about old Ruth. You remember Ruth in the, in the Old Testament Scriptures. What happened to Ruth for her to be providentially placed in a kingdom as well again as a queen to a king? Friend, I want you to understand that her husband died. 
She was in the edge of the fields scraping up with the beggars, getting the rounded part of the fields that was left over by the farmers. And here God would take her and, and cause her great suffering, but would give her great blessing. Friend, what am I telling you? Is that sometimes we just need to understand that the tragedy could be harsh in our lives. I don't understand why babies die. Well, I do. It's because of sin, it's because of self, and it's because of Satan. The fall explains it all. If you've got a question about why they're suffering in the world, it's because of sin and self and Satan. But I'm telling you, sometimes God allows some harsh things to come into the lives of Christians for a greater good. But friend, I want you to understand, for as harsh as the judgment of God might be in this providential working, that the blessing's going to be all the more. Job lost everything that he had and God gave him the same amount of children, gave him double the donkeys, double the cattle, double the money, gave him everything else doubled up and God gave great reward. But the tragedy can sometimes be harsh. It seems sometimes that God slays His servants for the purpose of a greater glory. Can I tell you, I had to learn some of this a little bit when I became a preacher. Boy, preachers ain't just being a hot shot and running around and, and uh, running up walls and getting paid and getting big offerings and getting all this stuff. No, I'm going to tell you that for the real servant, for the real preacher, the first thing God's going to do is He's going to bring you down to your knees. In fact, He's going to bring you down to your nose in the ground and humble you. He's going to break you and take everything in your life and turn it upside down and the first thing he's going to do is he's going to empty you of every ounce of pride that you got. I'm a testimony of it. Didn't realize how much pride and arrogance I had till I became a preacher and God still showed me today. Has to bend me over and take me to the woodshed and show me just how much pride I still got left. Friend, I want you to understand that the tragedy could be harsh. I don't even try to understand some of the tragedies. I can't even understand some things that some people have been through. Some have lost babies. Some have lost children. Some have lost spouses early in life. And there are such great things that come in our lives. But friend, I want you to understand the Scriptures say that everything that God brings us to, God will bring us through. And God will also reward and blessing for what we go through. Can I just remind you that the hope of our blessing is really not even in this world. It's not getting money back from a financial trouble. It's not getting a child back from a death. It's not getting a husband back from a loss. It's not uh, in some kind of marriage disaster in your life of getting that back. But can I tell you that our hope lies in the next world that regardless of what happens here, God's uh, making us a mansion already. There's a place of rest. We might not get rest on this side, but there's some hammocks in heaven. Amen. Some of them theologians Theologians want to argue with me there and say, that ain't right. But can I tell you, there's some rest in heaven. And I'll tell you today, friend, that everything God takes from us or uses us for on this side, heaven is going to be all worth it. I'd rather suffer on this side for the Lord than to have great gain of the devil. The tragedy could be harsh. Not only do we need to know that the timing could be long and the tragedy could be harsh, but when we think about suffering may endure for a season, we need to thirdly know that a triumph will be sure. This is the good part of the message, by the way. The triumph will be sure. As we look at uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, we look and we see, we know. What does he say? For we know. We have confidence what did he say there? He said, uh, and we know, confidence knowing that God is above every trial or anything that comes against us. He's bigger than the devil. He's bigger than our foes. And friend, I want to tell you, he's like a mad daddy when the devil comes up and messes with his children. Not only do we see here the triumph will be sure because we see we know with confidence, but it also says for good. All things are going to work for good. The end result is going to be good. Friend, I'm telling you, there's times I question God. There's times I bow my fist up and get about ready to wrestle with God like Jacob did. You say, well, that ain't very spiritual. Well, yes, that's just the flesh when we go through a lot of things. God, what you doing? God, you can bring me out of this. God, you won't do it. God, I'm getting a little bit of angry with you. I'm believing your word. I know you can. Why ain't you? Boy, you, you can speak everything into existence. You can bring Job out of, the, out of the pit and up to the palace, but you can't even bring me out of this little situation I got. God, where are you at? Friend, I want you to understand that we need to understand that the triumph will be sure if we'll be patient because God said we have confidence. We know 
For good is what it's going to turn out for. Grab this though, it also says His purpose. We can know that when we are surfing for His purposes in our Christian walk, that everything is going to be all right and we're going to triumph before it's all said and done. Can I just take you back to Esther's situation when she was providentially tried uh, for the, the help of her nation? Can I just remind you that her enemy and Mordecai's enemy, Haman, what happened to Haman? Haman had built uh, 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 places, decks for all of the Jews to be hanged and Mordecai to be hanged. And the very one that he said to build for Mordecai, he hanged on himself. Can I tell you that there's not an enemy that comes against you. There's not a person that is of the devil that's coming against you that God's going to take care of business for them. And even though he might not kill them, can I just tell you for everything that they do to work against you that God's going to work against them all the more. Friend, I want you to understand that Haman was hanged, but Joseph's brothers were humbled. Can I tell you that they came against him and they meant for wicked against him. They sold him into slavery and they were even going to murder him. But can I tell you at the end of the story, after Joseph is rose up in triumph in as second in the land of Egypt, Egypt, but also God dealt with his brothers and he humbled them and you know what happened? The very ones that said I'll never bow to you bow down in humility and they were glad to do so. Can I just remind you that triumph will be sure. Not only that, but we look and we see uh, that uh, there was individual blessing as they were suffering for God. Can I tell you that God is not a mean God? He's not an obnoxious God. He's not a God that just likes to make people suffer to, to feel His own authority and power. But friend, I want you to understand that God's purposes are for a sincere purpose. And God will reward you for what you do for Him. Friend, I want to tell you today, you want to know why it's so hard for people to stay in church? You want to know why it's so hard to stay faithful in membership to a church. You want to know why it's so faithful that many tuck tail and run midways of their life or midways after a couple of years of serving God and being faithful to the church after salvation. It's because we're going to fight trials in our life. And if we don't understand that those trials could be long and those trials could be harsh and we don't realize and look forward that triumph is going to come through it, you'll tuck tail and run like many do. Friend, I want you to understand today that triumph will be sure if we'll keep serving and keep faithfully following God through day in and through day out, through dark nights and through long mornings. Friend, I want you to understand that Isaiah chapter 54 verse 17 gives us a word of encouragement. Isaiah 54 17 says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. We have the promise in Scripture that there is nothing formed from the enemy. There's nothing that Satan can come in and put against us and there is nothing that God will put against us that will break us down to the point that we can't go. No weapon formed against us shall have benefit because we've got an armor that's bigger than the weapons thrown against us. We're not like over there in Ukraine and them boys throwing out tank busters on the tanks and them tanks getting busted all to pieces. Can I just tell you our armor, they can throw all of the, the tank busters they want. They can throw all all the missiles they want. The devil can throw all of the accusations at us that he wants, but they cannot prosper as long as we are rooted and grounded in God's Word. Not, not only that, but no weapons shall prosper, but no communication shall prosper. People speaking against you, talking against you, working against you, trying to defile your character, trying to ruin your reputation. Can I tell you? You stay grounded in God's Word and no word uh, will come sure from them. Because God's word is sure and God will give vengeance. Uh, God said uh, judgment was His. The triumph will be sure. I think about uh, uh, Psalms chapter 23. We all know Psalms 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Boy, it's a great verse uh, for those who are dead, but it's so much better for us that are living. Psalms chapter 23 and verse 4 and 5 uh, say this, uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. But listen to this. We have a promise here in the Word. Thou preparest a table before uh, me in the presence of mine enemies. 
I'm going to feast on some chicken bog, or maybe you want some filet mignon, or maybe you just want some, I don't know, some of y'all probably eat in fancy salads. But God has an ability for those who are walking through hard times, but they're walking in hard times with Him, for Him, are going to sit right in front of your enemy, and He's going to be hungry, and you're going to be smiling from ear to ear, chopping down on something good, because God is going to, uplift you right in front of your enemies and He won't let them not be around to see it. God's going to promote us. He's going to promote those who are faithful to Him and to those who go through the suffering for Him even though there are those who are wickedly working against Him. Friend, I want you to understand He's preparing a table and He's going to put you on display your victory right before them and they're going to be humbled for what they have done. Not only that, but in conclusion, as we think about suffering may endure for a season, we have the promise that it it could possibly be long, it could possibly be harsh, but we have the ultimate promise that a triumph will be sure in the Christian walk. Concluding and thinking about Psalms chapter 30 verse 5, as we think about suffering may endure for a season, I think of Psalms 30 and verse 5. It says this, For His anger, God's anger, endureth but a moment. In His favor is life. But listen to this. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. We understand and we're told that regardless of what we go through in life, that we have a holy God that is with us. And if you'll just keep digging and you'll keep moving and you'll keep moving forward and you'll keep believing God, believing that He's going to bring you through it, you're coming out on the other side. Not only will He benefit you and put you in places, but He's going to put you on demonstration so all the wicked can sit there and say, boy, did He make a fool out of us. You keep living for God, moving for God. As the musicians prepare to come and to sing in just a moment, friend, I want to ask you today, we're speaking to Christians this morning for the great help of even through trials. But friend, I want you to understand if you've never been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, if you've never acknowledged Him as your Lord and Savior, you don't have that help. You're going to go through trials. You're going to go through troubles. You're going to have people working against you too because there's a wicked generation out there that wants to bring anybody down. But the the difference between the child of God and from a lost person is that the lost person doesn't have the hope of God's Word. They don't have the promises. They don't have the comfort of God being with them. And you're not assured of any victory. And friend, I want to tell you that regardless of what trouble you go through on this side, there's a greater damnation for those who reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. There's an eternal lake of fire that you'll be cast into. Why? Because you would not believe in the Son of God. You would not believe in Him. Friend, I want you to understand, Jesus said... I've come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Can I tell you that the worst Christian life is sure a whole lot better than the best lost person's life in this world. You need to be saved. You need to be born again. How do I get born again? Come down to this altar. Just tell God. Kneel down in your heart. Say, God, I need you. I need you as a Savior. Friend, maybe you're here today and maybe you've been going through some trials. Maybe you've been going through some troubles and maybe you're just getting weary in that. Can I just remind you that triumph is sure. If you'll do your part to be faithful to God's Word, God will surely be faithful to bring you through it. It may take a while. may take a little bit longer than what you want it to. Or you know what? It just might be quick when you kneel down and give it to Him. But God is with you and joy can come in the morning. That word and that verse of joy is going to come in the morning was regardless of the hardship that was going on. Even though they were suffering, joy is coming in the morning. Presently, you can have joy in the midst of your trials regardless of how long they are. The promise to the Christian friend, can you just put faith in God again? Maybe you say, well, good message, boy, I tell you what, but I'm glad I ain't suffering. Can I tell you, you're going to need this message one day. Better roll it up, put it in your back pocket. Because trials are coming. The devil's fighting. And even sometimes, God's providentially putting you in places that you could greater help His kingdom work. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to You in the name of Jesus. We thank You for Your blessings, Your mercy, Your grace. We don't understand it all, Lord. And God, we don't even like it. 
This human flesh doesn't like suffering or sacrificing. But God, we just simply yield to You, asking God not for persecution, not even for trial, but God, just help us to be faithful to what You bring us to. And God, I pray and claim victory for those who have been struggling for a while. I do pray, God, bring them out of it. Take them to the palace. Prepare the table. And God, the very things and the people that worked against them, God, may they look in shame as they see Your great glory upon the servants who are faithful. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand and sing, you be obedient this morning as God leads us. Altars open.